Conditional expectation is just orthogonal projection. That's the mantra that I want you to keep repeating. Now, that makes literal sense if the random variable x that we're taking a conditional expectation of is L2. If x is not L2 but is only in L1, then as we saw last time, we can extend the conditional expectation linear transformation all the way to L1 and it retains basically all of the same properties. But we can't use the orthogonal projection and inner product language exactly the same way anymore. Instead, what we have is the averaging lemma, which is our replacement in the L1 context. The averaging lemma says that we can identify the conditional expectation of a random variable x given a subsigma field g as the unique L1 g measurable function with this property here. The expected value of the conditional expectation of x times y is equal to the expected value of x times y for every bounded g measurable random variable y. Now, this more or less says the same thing as the divining characteristics of the orthogonal projection. If we subtract x from both sides over here and combine using linearity of the expectation, this says that the dot product of conditional expectation of x minus x with any of these y's is zero. In other words, it's orthogonal to these y's. That's exactly what defines orthogonal projection, except in that case, we have to take all L2 y's for it to work or any dense subset of L2 will do the trick. And this is a dense subset of L2 with the benefit that this integral makes sense on both sides for any L1 random variable x, especially since as we showed, the conditional expectation of x is also L1 and has L1 norm less than or equal to the original L1 norm of x. Let's use that averaging property now to compute and identify several conditional expectations. As the first basic example, what happens if we condition on the full sigma field f that we started with? Well, in that case, the conditional expectation of x is actually just x itself. To see that, simply note that x is, of course, an f measurable random variable and vacuously satisfies this equation. The expected value of x times y is the expected value of x times y for every f measurable y. Now, if f were L2, this is just reflecting the fact that if you orthogonally project a vector into a space where it already lives, you just get that vector back. It's worth taking a moment to repeat the argument that gives us uniqueness in the averaging lemma in order to cement it in our minds here. That is, we get a unique answer here as x because if the expected value of z times y is equal to the expected value of x times y for all bounded f measurable functions y. Well, that says following our orthogonal projection intuition, the expected value of z minus x times y is equal to zero for all of these y's. And let's in particular take y to be the following f measurable random variable, the signum of x minus z times the cutoff, the indicator of the set where x minus z is less than or equal to n in absolute value. That is f measurable because it's a function of x minus z, both of which are f measurable, and it's bounded because of this cutoff. And if we sub that in, that tells us that zero is equal to the expected value of the absolute value of z minus x times that cutoff indicator of the set where x minus z in absolute value is less than or equal to n. That's true for every n, but by the dominated convergence theorem with x minus z as our uniform bounding L1 random variable, that converges to the expected value of the absolute value of z minus x. And that being zero tells us that z is equal to x almost surely. We surely do not have to go through that argument every time. It's just good to remember that that's what's really powering the averaging lemma in this L1 versus bounded case. Now, let's look at the other side of the spectrum. Instead of conditioning on the largest sigma field that we can, what if we condition on the smallest sigma field that we can? This, the trivial sigma field containing only the empty set and the full space omega, is of course a sub-sigma field. Now in this case, we don't really need the averaging lemma because the space of measurable functions with respect to this sigma field is so small. That is, this space of measurable functions is exactly equal to the set of all constant functions.
The reason is just as follows. If I take any possible value t in the range, its preimage under any y that is measurable with respect to g must be a set in g, which means it must equal either the empty set or the full probability space. In other words, that's saying that each t is either not in the range, or if it is in the range, then every point in the sample space gets mapped to t, which is to say that y is the constant t. So these are only constant functions, and therefore the conditional expectation of x given g is a constant function. Which constant function is it? Well, in order to answer that, let's look at the next calculation, which we will use the averaging property for. What is the expected value of the conditional expectation of x given g? Here, g doesn't have to be this or this, but can be any sigma field. Well, we can compute this using the averaging property just by noting that this is the same thing as the expected value of the conditional expectation of x times 1 on the inside. And the constant function 1, since it's measurable with respect to this minimal sigma field, is measurable with respect to every sigma field, g, and therefore, by the averaging property, this will be the same as the expectation of x times 1, which is just the expected value of x. So that says that whatever we condition on, we don't change the expected value. The expected value of the conditional expectation is always the same as the original expected value. And that means that if we take this minimal sigma field here and we know that the conditional expectation is a constant, we know what constant it has to be. It has to be the expected value. Now let me just note one more time that we should always be thinking of orthogonal projections in the back of our mind. What this argument really showed us here, what we were doing is saying, hey, the conditional expectation is the orthogonal projection onto k, k being L2 of the g-measurable functions. And we're taking that orthogonal projection and taking its inner product with 1. That's what this is. Now we can use the self-adjointness of the projection and move it over to the other side. That's the inner product of x with the projection of 1. But 1 is in L2 of g for every g. So that means that its projection into that space where it already lives is just itself. And that gives us this here. Now, it turns out that we can actually reduce the conditions even further in the averaging lemma. We don't need to test against all bounded measurable functions here. If we want, we can only test against indicator functions of measurable sets themselves. And that's what the next lemma says. We can identify an L1 runner variable z as equal to the conditional expectation of x given g, provided that it is an L1 g measurable function. And if I take the expected value of z times the indicator function of b, I should always get the expected value of x times the indicator function of b for all g sets b. Just to remind you that that's what this notation here means. Now, this lemma is very straightforward. The forward direction, that if z is this conditional expectation, then this holds true, is just noticing that the indicator function of b is a bounded g measurable map. And so from the averaging property, we will get equality here. For the reverse, we need to say, hey, if I know this holds for all indicator functions of g-measurable sets, then it must also hold for all bounded g-measurable functions. And doing so is exactly a prototypical example of applying Dinkin's multiplicative systems theorem. I'm going to leave the details of that to you, and so call this proved. We're now going to use this to look at a very illustrative example that explains a lot of what conditional expectation really is. Suppose that our base probability space is actually a product space. We have two probability spaces, omega 1 f1 p1 and omega 2 f2 p2, and we take random variables on the product space. And I'd like to take conditional expectation onto the following sub sigma field. I can inject f1 into the product sigma field f1 product f2 in this natural way. I just take the set of all events in f1 and take their product with the full probability space omega 2. This is a sub sigma field of this. The only potentially tricky point to understand is how do you find the empty set in here? And that's just because if I take the empty set times omega 2, this is the set of all ordered pairs 
omega one, omega two, for which omega one is in here, and oh, well, it doesn't matter. There is no omega one in there, and so this is actually the empty set. So if I take any L1 random variable on the product space, can I identify its conditional expectation given this sub sigma field G? Let's call it Z. And the thing to note is, of course, as usual, that Z is G measurable. So we'd like to understand what it means to be a G measurable function for this G. Well, let's follow our nose from what we did in the last example and look at the pre-image of such a Z on any value in the range. That has to be something that's in the sigma field G, which is F1 times omega two. In other words, if I can find some point omega one, omega two, that gets mapped under Z to the value T, then it follows that for any other omega two, omega two prime, I'll also get T. That is to say, really such a Z of omega one and omega two is constant in the second variable. It's just some measurable function Z prime of omega one. So we can see that what we're doing here when we're taking the conditional expectation is projecting two variable functions onto one variable functions. How do we implement that projection? That's what conditional expectation is. So to see how, we will use the lemma at the beginning and the end. The lemma tells us that we only need to check this. We need to find z such that this expected value is the same as this one for all indicator functions of sets in G, which means indicator of A times omega two for any A in the first sigma field F1. Well, let's write out what those expected values are. They're double integrals and we will readily make use of Fubini's theorem here. We'll write the left-hand side as the double integral on the outside over omega two and on the inside over A of this function z of omega one omega two which we know is just z prime of omega one and now we note that once we've done the inside integral we have a constant because z prime doesn't depend on omega two that constant integrates against p2 to itself and so this is just the integral over a of z prime dp1 now for the right hand side, we will also write it as a double integral, but this time let's decide to write it in the other order. This is going to be the double integral on the outside over a and on the inside over omega two of x of omega one, omega two, p two, p one. Now in this case, the inside integral does give us something that still depends on omega one. But that exactly identifies the conditional expectation for us. Because now employing the lemma again, what we have here is Z prime, which is an L1 random variable, thanks to Fubini's theorem, which is going to be measurable with respect to F1. And it integrates over any F1 measurable set A to the same thing as this, which is the integral over any F1 measurable set A of this inside function here, which by Fubini's theorem, integrating out the second variable, is an L1 F1 measurable function of the first variable. And so therefore by the lemma, we can conclude that the function Z prime, which is after all just the function Z of omega one and omega two, which we know is actually constant in omega two, is exactly equal to the integral over omega two of X of omega one, omega two integrated against P2. That's what orthogonal projection, that is conditional expectation, onto this first factor sigma field G is. It's just integrating out the second variable to give us a function of one variable. And that is a key insight into what conditional expectation really is in general. In fact, we shouldn't call it conditional expectation, we should call it partial expectation. Let me just rant on that for a moment. Conditional is a terrible name for this whole operation within probability theory because it makes it sound like we're placing conditions 
on x. And it's actually just the reverse, as we've seen from our examples on the last two slides. If we take g as large as possible, the whole sigma field we started with, placing the most conditions, it actually doesn't constrain x at all. We just get x back. Whereas if we take g to be the smallest possible sigma field, just the trivial sigma field, placing as few conditions as we can, it actually maximally constrains x, and all we're left with is the vague shadow of x being its expectation itself as a constant. This is the wrong intuition. We should not think of placing conditions. We should not think of putting constraints. Instead, every time you hear conditioned on, I want you to think projected on. Or alternatively, thinking of the last example, think of conditional expectation as doing partial integration. We are integrating out the dependence of the random variable on things that are outside the sigma field g that we're conditioning on. So it might even make sense to label it with a g complement instead of a g. Now this partial integration analogy is quite apt, allowing us to think of conditional expectation as a kind of expectation, as a kind of integral. And in fact, there are conditional versions of all of the integral convergence theorems and inequalities that we proved in measure theory, as we'll see next.